Happy World Bronchiectasis Day 2023. It's my pleasure as the president of the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform to welcome you to today's webinar. GAP is excited to co-host this World Bronchiectasis Day webinar alongside ADA, the Advocacy and Awareness for Immune Disorders Association. Here you see both of our organization's missions, and absolutely today is an important day in the life of those living with bronchiectasis. It is only the second annual World Awareness Day recognizing this condition. And we know that, again, this condition is impacting many, many patients across the globe. And so it's our pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. I also would be remiss in not thanking our sponsors, Monaghan Medical and Zambone, for their support of this webinar. Now let's meet our speakers for today's webinar. As I said, I'm Tanya Winders, the president of the Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform and based in the United States. I'm joined today by Ms. Lauren Dunlap, who is the founder of ADA, along with being a patient living with non-CF bronchiectasis. Next, I'm joined by Dr. Ashok Gupta, who is a professor of pediatrics and department head and patient advocate for Allergy Care India. And finally, I'm joined by Dr. Ghulam Mustafa, pediatric pulmonologist from Pakistan, who is also the founder and leader of Helping Hands Foundation. First, we will hear from Ms. Dunlap with her experience of living with non-CF bronchiectasis. Thank you, Tanya. And um, just a quick backstory on mine um, about being a patient. I was diagnosed in 2009, at, and it's been quite an interesting journey. So along that 14-year journey, I've learned several things, and that's something that I just wanted to share with other patients. So the first thing, um, if we learned anything from the pandemic, it was definitely being away from sick people um, and not going out and, you know, when you're sick and being having that exposure. So I always say this, it seems like common sense, but um, if, you're, if you know somebody's sick, stay away from it, especially if you have a chronic um, um, lung condition like bronchiectasis is. Um, so, or anybody with a respiratory illness. So, um, the other point I like to make that people generally do not think about is um, because a lot of people use jacuzzis and um, spas in the summer, hot tubs, I mean in, in the winter, excuse me, they should be very mindful and careful with those as um, there's, if they're not cleaned properly, that could lead patients to potential exposure that they would then cause illness and get and get sick so just be very careful with those and make sure they're being cleaned and maintained properly um, there are other sources and environments that can potentially cause um, contaminants to enter you know the, the air the atmosphere that patients also want to be aware of and not um, expose themselves to one um, thing that I, I think about envi natural environments as well and other events. Um, so a lot of wildfires are happening across the country and the world um, in the last several years. As a patient living with bronchiectasis, you need to stay away from those, um, if you can, environments um, with, with, that cause smoke and other particles in the air. This actually just happened to me yesterday. Um, I was telling Dr. Gupta about it, was um, there was a lot of particles in the air and I started having exacerbations um, and, ch and pain and that kind of thing that comes with, if you live with it, you know, it's kind of a unique feeling, um, with different particles and there was some other pollen or something in the air and that just exacerbated underlying symptoms. So be mindful of definitely the uh, natural environments that you are around um, so you can protect yourself in those situations. So one of my favorite things is to break stigmas and there is in my world a big stigma 
with um, bronchiectasis and um, the literature, not the literature, but the pictures that come with some of these, some of the literature that is really kind of irritates me, I'm going to be honest. So oftentimes the um, illustrations show images of elderly or older people, but really bronchiectasis can be diagnosed at any age. I was diagnosed um, in my mid-20s with this condition and nobody really thought to think, why does she have the lungs of an 80 year old in her mid-20s? So that was also very frustrating for me. Um, every time I look, you know, th there's just images of older, elderly people. So that's with my own story, I wanted to break that stigma down a little bit more um, than what it necessarily is portrayed in, portrayed as, rather. Um, another stigma that maybe patients or loved ones or caregivers um, might wrestle with is that these patients, you, you are not frail. You are not like a tiny infant. You can do all these activities that you want to do and still live your life. Just because you have a diagnosis doesn't mean that should stop you from um, going and doing the things that you really want to do. You can always be mindful but, and cautious, but you can still live your life. So those are my two biggest points with <laughs> breaking down these stigmas associated with this disease. So um, this is a busy slide, <laughs> but there are a, a, different, um, a lot of different treatment options. I've actually um, had tried all these different options. Oh, look, th they're, they're elderly pictures. See, that's on the internet. You can look it up. <laughs> all these pictures are. So um, really, you, you need to focus on a treatment option that fits your lifestyle. And what I mean by that is all these on the screen um, do different things. And they're all different sizes as well. So um, the aerobica is actually, and the acapella at the bottom, they're handheld. They easily can be put into a, a purse or a bag and, and taken with you when you travel. Um, the picture at the bottom right with the lady in the blue vest, that is the, um, the vest airway clearance system and that it's pretty heavy along with the, the other three pictures but they you were actually like you have to plug it into the wall so it's not as portable but it has they have made them a little bit portable more portable um, the guy right there in the in the middle I've, I've used that when I've been in the hospital um, at various times it's a lot similar to the ladies except the vest is a little bit different and then finally the guy at the top he that is a new new word device it came out about five years ago um, it's called the the monarch um, airway clearance system and basically um, it's the same as the other two but it's it's um, you can move with it where you're attached to the wall and to the machine with other options this one you can walk around it has a battery pack on it it's pretty heavy you know so that's another thing when you're trying to pick out a device that would work best for you and if, how, if you travel, if you have small children, that kind of thing. Um, so that's when I said it's not a one size fit all. As well as, um, you know, there's, there's prophylactic antibiotics that they're using more now too with some of these, um, these cases of, with the patients. I tried it, it didn't work for me for about a year and a half, but again, it's not a one size fits all. Oh, this is my fun slide. Tanya, you've seen this, you've seen that. So this is also, um, along with treatment options, you have nebulizer treatments and um, inhaler treatments. Well, this is my nebulizer <laughs> and it's a little puppy and it even comes in a, in a case. So that's why I wanted to show this slide because um, it actually makes me more compliant to have my little dog um, nebulizer. <laughs> to do it with instead of like just something boring. <laughs> oh, and I'm wearing my vest in the background. Okay, so I also wanted to discuss mental and physical health because this is a really big um, thing with patients living with this disease or, or any type of chronic illness. We'll start on the mental health side because if your mental health is not good, your physical health is not good and that's gonna also exacerbate 
any type of illness or symptoms you might be having. So on the top of the mental health list, socialize with your loved ones and friends and go out and meet people. Do not self-isolate. And that is so true for your mental and your physical health. That's why I also have it on, on, on both sides. As well as go outside because it's been proven that being outdoors in nature is beneficial to both mental and physical health, thereby boosting the immune system. And that I can't emphasize being outside enough and getting outside and exercising, strengthening your lungs, that kind of thing. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But definitely help yourself and your mental health with living with a chronic condition. Um, by You can um, find, seek out support groups. They're, they're pretty helpful as well as uh, tell patients to um, maybe they want to work with a, a, a therapist or other licensed mental health provider that is skilled and trained in working with patients that live with chronic conditions and uh, understand that because that is a definite specialty in in their field so physical health <laughs> I, I, I keep saying this go outside <laughs> get outside and if you can um, there are other things you can do if you cannot go outside if it's raining or you know maybe there's a fire forest fire and you can't go outside because you'll get sick or exacerbate symptoms. There's things you can do at home. And again, strengthen your lungs with the exercise. That's going to be beneficial in every capacity. I hike, bike, um, gosh, what do I do? I do everything outside. So that is something I really wanted to emphasize too, as well as eat healthy. Again, it's going to boost your immune system and get enough sleep. So when you are tired, when you're exhausted, get sleep, get rest when you need it. I, I, I hit on this earlier because I can't emphasize enough is be mindful of the environments that you're around, uh, around sick people and stay away from them. So you can also stay out of the hospital as well and maintain your safety. So, you know, when you are sick, that is very frustrating as a patient because there's all things that go with it the a, a lot of the unknown and a lot of times um, I know that I've done this as well as the patients that do this too is again don't self-isolate stay connected with your friends and your family or loved ones um, so you can again going back to the mental health aspect that's going to help you in the long run and if you are tired or you're exhausted or you were really, really sick, ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help um, because, again, all this ties in together will be beneficial to you um, in your treatment and your, in your treatment journey as well as just healing. Okay, and I really wanted to share this picture um, next because I think it says so much um, with how many people, countries, um, cultures that this disease um, affects. And also just to say, have a happy and healthy World Bronchiectasis Day. And I'm gonna pass the mic to Dr. Gupta, who is looking sharp in that picture right there. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. And uh, uh, good morning, everybody. And at the outset, I would like to thank Gap and Tanya, especially for having taken this initiative because this is unbelievable uh, because bronchiectasis have for a very long phase has been a very chronic uh, illness which has been neglected neglected even by the uh, medical fraternity so it's a great initiative and uh, why i say so because uh, even in the pediatric from the pediatric perspective we have started seeing children as young as one and two years having bronchiectic changes in their lungs and this is something which uh, really makes you alert and aware that it needs to get the right focus. So our bronchiectasis is a disease defined by localized irreversible dilatation of part of the bronchial tree, which is, which is usually caused by the destruction of the muscle and the elastic tissue, and is classified as an obstructive lung disease. Just to show you a schematic presentation, if you see uh, in the slide on the upper side, it is the normal airway. And if you look at the lower side, which has a green base inside it, it shows a destroyed 
airway and this destruction primarily is a result of infection, inflammation. So uh, if you have an infection or an inflammation, it's going to bring about an epithelial damage, it is going to bring about a muscle damage and the result would be a dilated bronchi bronchiole. And so once you have a dilated airway, uh, the result is stasis and results in recurrent infections. Now what, what produces this dilatation is important because uh, there are a number of predisposing situations. It could be infection, it could be inflammation, it could be immune disorder and sometimes it's also genetic uh, disease, for example cystic fibrosis. So a number of disorders can bring about that initiation of the disease. And so that when we talk of uh, bronchiitis, our focus today in the world is to see that such damage is not initiated because you are born with a healthy lung except for individuals who have genetic disorders. Most of us are born with healthy lungs and these healthy lungs can be protected if we take the right decision in terms of immunization, in terms of treating the infection appropriately and uh, in time. And so if you look at the focus of the disorder is one, you have an airway infection. So if it is treated appropriately, for example, if you have a pseudomonas infection, you need to treat it appropriately. And if you have an exacerba exacerbation, you have to think in of, of long-term inhaled antibiotics also. And uh, once you have airway inflammation, you look at uh, long-term anti-inflammatory therapies and uh, macrolides are currently being used extensively. And for the failure of mucociliary clearance, which is again responsible for the uh, large segment of manifestations, you need to do airway clearance and use mucoactive treatments. And uh, ultimately, if you have a structural damage, you need to optimize treatment and especially adhere to the treatment. Think of pulmonary rehabilitation and uh, sometimes you also need to do surgery which could be a localized uh, lung resection. I'll just take you through some of the slides uh, uh, which indicates that uh, bronchiitis uh, in different parts of the world may have different connotations and that is why you, we cannot, we have to be cautious in interpreting the findings and the intervention responses because uh, uh, this is one study which I'm trying to quote from India where we had 31 centers across the country which were which made an analysis, we were part of the Embark uh, study, and uh, we uh, wanted to understand uh, what is the factor, what are the etiological factors responsible for bronchiectasis in that part of the world. And uh, what was uh, uh, really an eye-opener, because if you look at uh, the pie chart here, tuberculosis turned out to be the biggest cause of bronchiectasis in, uh, in that part of the world. So it's a big difference with 35% with of the uh, patients uh, of bronchitis is having tuberculosis as the primary disease. And uh, so if you need, uh, because this is one disorder which can be treated very easily. So the focus uh, of uh, the management or our interventions need to be very customized based on the region and interpretation of the various findings of these uh, areas. Then we have uh, in India, it's, uh, the post-infective etiology because measles, influenza and other viral diseases are more common than most other uh, parts of the world which uh, accounts for almost 22%. 21% of the cases did not have a defined uh, etiology. Allergic uh, aspergillosis has turned out to be a very, very important uh, etiological factor, which is what's uh, an eye-opener for most of us. So that's uh, something which was very important, that we need to create a baseline epidemiology from a global perspective. And I believe GAP would take a lead and uh, initiate uh, inter uh, interaction with the various medical societies to move in this direction and to create a mapping of the world on the kind of interventions uh, that need to be very specific in the different regions. And uh, we also made an attempt to understand uh, what uh, has the portion of the lung that gets affected. And what we found was that uh, whether it's the upper lobe or the middle or the lower lobe, e each one of them was getting equally affected. And uh, the severity index when we did uh, analyze, we found that uh, the patients in uh, with bronchiectasis uh, from our part uh, had a much more severe uh, disease. They had a much early onset of the disease. They had, uh, they were, the disease was more aggressive and all the parameters of BSI, that is your bronchiectasis sev uh, severity index were really bad in uh, that part. So uh, it starts early, it's more severe, more aggressive, needs more aggressive management and more uh, thought on how do you really prevent the disease from happening. In general, the risk factors for developing bronchiectasis include severe or recurrent uh, chest infections, for example, uh, whooping cough in children, which we still see, uh, 
has been responsible for a lot of these uh, children moving into bronchitis. So that when you said young age at 20 years, I believe uh, things have changed since then. And uh, India is uh, really seeing a lot of children with very, very, very young age. Then foreign body, then you can have congenital or acquired immune deficiency disorders. And sometimes the uh, problems of ciliary function because uh, the mucus clearance uh, may not take place appropriately. So uh, these are the risk factors which uh, are in general uh, responsible for the development of bronchiectasis. And so when we evaluate these patients, one of the focus would be yes, uh, the history, that is any history of frequent infections because uh, most of these children when they come to us, they would have had history of uh, recurrent lower respiratory manifestations, especially asthma, or you can have a, a recurrent, uh, Im uh, if you have an immune deficiency, especially the IgA, you tend to develop uh, pneumonias very often. And even if uh, you do not have IgA deficiency, but uh, undernutrition, which is again one of the is uh, important issues in that part of the world, can be responsible for recurrent infections. And uh, furthermore, because of overcrowding and poverty and uh, uh, these are the other factors which are responsible for the uh, increased instance of uh, communicable diseases, they'll uh, all result in frequent infections. Foreign body, uh, though not very common, yes, uh, it can also be responsible for bronchiectasis. And then uh, uh, other systemic infections, they only give you a clue to the possibility of underlying immune deficiency disease. And for the current uh, case situation, our focus is to ask for recurrent infections, then chronic uh, production of purulent sputum, because one of the manifestations is going to be uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, cough, productive cough, and sometimes it's green, sometimes it's yellow uh, sputum that is being produced. And some of these children or adults would also have uh, blood-stained sputum, which is hemoptysis, and recurrent V's and breathlessness. So if you have uh, V's, because not all V's is going to be uh, reactive airway disease because uh, most children or most individuals are getting treated uh, for asthma. But the fact is this wheeze is a uh, reflection of, because and they do not do uh, uh, very well with the, even with the bronchodilator therapy alone. So, so if anybody has a, a recurrent wheeze and breathlessness, one would, uh, this will give you a clue to the possibility of uh, bronchiectasis as a disease. And uh, if you do examine these individuals, uh, some of them have evidence of uh, clubbing and uh, auscultation. You find that there are some uh, thick or coarse crackles which are seen usually in the lung basis. And we may also find occasional Vs. And uh, the basic investigations, uh, we, what we would normally do is try to assess the functional ability of the lung using the spirometry, because you need to understand what is the baseline functional ability of the lung. As we move further in the management plan, we this will be of help to understand the progression of the disease. The diagnostic criteria is to do a radiology, which includes the chest X-ray and the CT scan. We do investigate uh, the uh, for the immune deficiency disorders using hematological markers. A sputum test is done to understand uh, the presence of a secondary bacterial disease and also for cystic fibrosis. This is just to show you uh, a representative X-ray, and uh, this is the CT chest, which shows the extensively dilated airways. And so when we uh, embark on the management plan, it is to control the manifestations, improve the quality of life. That's uh, one of the most important areas. You need to improve the quality of life of individuals, reduce exacerbations, and maintain the lung functions. And there is clear evidence that patients with bronchiectasis who have more frequent exacerbations would have a worse quality of life. And uh, this is uh, just to show you the most commonly prescribed treatments for patients with bronchiectasis and the quality of care indicators. And if you look at uh, the, bro the inhalation treatment, the, uh, the inhaled corticosteroids are the number one, followed by the lavas, that is the long-acting bronchodilators. And uh, then we, if you look at uh, the long-term antibiotic therapy, we have some of these uh, individuals who are on uh, long-term antibiotic therapy, usually with macrolides and, uh, and uh, the various uh, indicators of seriousness. If you look at a lot of them uh, manifest as uh, with high BSI scores. So when we talk of management, the management, I have already said, it's uh, going to be a sequential approach to the management. And uh, 
so uh, when we are moving into the management plan, we have to be uh, understanding the time of onset, the severity of the disease, the underlying disease. So the management plan will be divided into a symptomatic management, a supportive management, specific management, and uh, sometimes surgery. Because uh, if you have a specific disease which has a treatment available, then you start working on those disease programs. For example, if you have an auto-inflammatory or immune dysregulation, there are now drugs which have come up uh, which, is, which are going to take care of the immune dysregulation of some of these patients. And if you have uh, an, uh, tuberculosis, you need to treat tuberculosis. So the underlying disease needs to be addressed too. Number two, uh, if you have a uh, secondary uh, infection uh, with pseudomonas, you need to treat pseudomonas ac accordingly. And then you do a symptomatic management. The symptomatic management uh, would require uh, dilatation of the bronchioles so that uh, there is uh, airway clearance can take place. And uh, we also would uh, use the various mechanics as shown by Lauren. Uh, to improve the clearance of the uh, mucus from the lungs. And then uh, we also do uh, the supportive management. The importance of uh, sputum is uh, already identified that yes, pseudomonas has been one of the most important pathogens identified in the sputum. So because there have been uh, different geographical, geographical variations, some of these countries have reported H influenza as the principal organism, whereas uh, part of the world says pseudomonas. And uh, uh, when you compare the uh, microbiology in the two parts, you certainly find, yes, uh, different countries having different uh, organisms responsible. A lot of uh, different guidelines are today available. The only thing that we need to understand is if you have to treat an acute exacerbation, once again, uh, focus on the etiology, whether it's bacterial or viral. Sputum is obtained for gram staining in culture prior to antibiotic administration. There are no randomized control trial evaluating the efficacy of antibiotics in exacerbations in adults, and no randomized control trial which says one route is better over the other. And there are very few randomized trials to say for pa pathogen based therapy. So, bronchitis patients are typically given prolonged courses of antibiotics of 14 days duration for infective exacerbations. And uh, it, the treatment is based on expert consensus and studies that documented good clinical outcomes with such treatment regimes. However, evidence base for the duration is poor. The European Respiratory Society Task Force Panel suggests that mild exacerbations or exacerbations in mild patients, those associated with pathogens more sensitive to antibiotics or patients with a rapid return to baseline state may benefit from shorter courses. But evidence supporting shorter courses treatment is still uh, uh, still lacking. So uh, absence of any direct data comparing longer and shorter courses of antibiotics, my suggestion would be to continue the usual practice of treating acute exacerbations of bronchiectasis with 14 days of antibiotics. Uh, these are different guidelines. I don't want you to go into the details of this. and. Uh, the focus today on eradication therapy is there and uh, so we also have certain long-term therapies which include the antibiotics, the statins, the inhaled corticosteroids, bronchodilators and others. And thank you with this, I'd like to end my talk. Yeah, so our next uh, presentation would be from Gulam Mustafa from Pakistan. Gulam. Okay. Thank you very much, Gupta, <coughs> Lauren, and Tony. Uh, welcome to the world of Bronchitis Day. I'm really uh, thankful, and uh, I, I would appreciate Tony and uh, uh, Dunlop for uh, this great step that they have taken. They need real appreciation because this is something, although which is uh, it's many times underreported, it is there, people don't know about it, but definitely what it is, that it is neglected. So now there are many cases in thousands, but still it is very neglected. So this World Bronchiectasis Day is one opportunity that helps to make the people aware of this uh, problem uh, in the context of many things, and I'll come to it a few of those at least uh, before we wind up. Uh, again, I would say that this is a great effort 
by Tony and Dunlop that they are focusing and they are trying to make the people aware of it. Before I, well, that's one I, my promise is that I'm not going to make you doctor like Gupta. But I will definitely talk about few things which are important. The very first of thing, before we go into the details, one is important that although we define bronchiectasis as something which is irreversible, but truly speaking, if we diagnose it early, being a pediatrician, I know that if we take into consideration and we diagnose these children early on, then there is a real possibility in many cases because it's cause dependent. So we take care, we can take care of many causes and we can reverse it if we take it, if we diagnose it early, we start treating it earlier, then it can be very much helpful. And the second problem is, and that is again, I think, which is related to the World Bronchiectasis Day, and that is a message we have to know that we have to decrease this duration of diagnosis. Generally, the du duration of diagnosis is very long. Even Dunlop, why she has been diagnosed? Well, she, in, after so much, uh, so long a time, and why she would have not been diagnosed earlier? Uh, I believe uh, she is diagnosed 14 years or, or before, and I believe that she is not uh, 15 years, that otherwise she would have been diagnosed at the age of one year. But had it she been, then her diagnosis is like primary immune deficiency that can be quite better can be taken care of. That is for sure. So one thing important that we need to understand for this World Bronchiectasis Day is that this duration, which in our countries is like more than 10 years, plus minus two, three years, that means it takes around eight to 15 years that before a child is diagnosed. Even in Saudi Arabia, where I am working nowadays, over there, the still the time is five plus three minus, and that makes around three to eight years. Almost, it is that it is going to be diagnosed. So this is such a long time that is taken before a person or child uh, is diagnosed. Generally speaking, as Dunlop earlier said, that it was uh, people think that it is that something an age age-related and it's quite after 50 years, 60 years. Well, that's not the case always. And we are looking at the cases where they are being diagnosed as early as in one year, in the very first year, uh, because uh, depending on the, again, etiology and all the things. And that, that helps to make the prognosis better. Like cystic fibrosis, the children, they would die in the first two years of age previously when there were no facilities. But now there are multidisciplinary approach Multiple people are taking care of it. So now the prognosis for the cystic fibrosis has gone quite up. Now the people are living more than 40 years, 50 years of age, and they are living very quite normally. Uh, in a very, uh, I mean, they are being treated and they're uh, in a very nice way so that they can perform the life activities in a very nice way. Uh, so having said that, so let me go back to the, uh, let me come back to the, World Bronchiectasis Day. So what bronchiectasis is? But before going to the bronchiectasis, let's say what normally our lungs do. Our lungs are like a tubes. So these tubes, they are being washed by our, uh, inside the, our tubes, we have not only secretions, we have brushes, just like the duster we have. So that brush, they keep on moving toward the upside and they take all the bacteria, all the secretions, all the harmful uh, dust particles, everything that goes inside our lungs, they just take it out, they keep moving, they keep washing all the airway, and our airways, they are kept free of all those things. So what happens in bronchiectasis? In bronchiectasis, we have outpocketing. Like in a corridor, we have a side, side room or in a tube, we have a, some side pocket. So if we have something like that, obviously, then that pocket needs to be specially cle cleared off. Otherwise, dust particles, bacteria, viruses, multiple things, they can, put, they can stay there, and then they can lead to the uh, infection or the dam further damage of the airways. So we need a particular, uh, we need special care to clear those areas which have been dilated and they are not smooth now. So the brush borders, they are not very 
active over there and they will be um, they will not be able to clear off the all the harmful bacteria and the dust particles and everything having said that now again this is a world bronchiectasis day coming to that there are two world of bronchiectasis one is the lower middle income countries world and the other is the high income world countries bronchiectasis the two are very different in many aspects like the very first etiology if we come to the etiology if i look at at the pakistan or the lower middle income countries all over there tuberculosis is rampant gupta says his study told 35% our studies from our area they are telling more than 50% when we look at the etiology of the bronchiectasis we find it more than 52% even uh, that means more than 50% they are of those of tuberculosis so it is simply a tuberculosis which is affecting over there although we have got a very good coverage of um, uh, this immunization for bcg for tb but still the major etiology is uh, tuberculosis not only tuberculosis but infection also uh, and the post infectious even in saudi arabia uh, we don't have tuberculosis but the post infection is very common so the lower middle income countries they come up with a major chunk of etiology as a tuberculosis a disease which the high income countries even do not know even the students even the doctors they don't know how it is going to present and how it is going to be there so it's entirely different as far as etiology is concerned even in uh, the causative organisms like the, there is mycobacterium in our country but in saudi arabia it was the highest is yield is with the h influenzae and the streptococcus pneumoniae it is more likely with the post infectious although it's also post infectious but the cause of infection is different in uh, saudi arabia and like in the other asian countries so it's different over there but high income countries they are entirely different they go with the pseudomonas and um, aspergillosis and all that so etiology is different in over the two areas the second important thing is that the time of diagnosis the time of diagnosis is very delayed is very much delayed in the lower middle income countries it is delayed in the high income countries as well but relatively earlier the children they are or the adults or adolescents they are there they are relatively early diagnosed causes are many uh, but one thing is that uh, in lower middle income countries because as the tuberculosis is there and in bronchiectasis there is problem with the chest symptom is the same there is cough the cough would be there even in the lower middle income countries or the developed world or in the high income countries cough will be there and it will be wet in the both the areas it will be the same then there will be recurrent infection fever again and again it will be there same but when the child will go to a doctor in the lower middle income countries he will think of okay he is having cough which is not resolving it is more than 2 weeks 3 weeks so he will start thinking of the tuberculosis he is going to treat tuberculosis he will treat some infection will be treated and child will become a bit better but after that again he will have another infection another infection after some time then the doctor is going to think oh maybe something else so then he would go with x rays or like uh, ct chest which in this case we need to diagnose that is the minimum uh, investigation to confirm the diagnosis that this is a uh, bronchiectasis so we need to have a ct chest but that test is done quite afterwards not at the beginning of the uh, illness initially they are going to think of something infection and infection like tuberculosis so that is how it is delayed and uh, not everybody would go with ct chest but they will continue uh, after one course they will think of the resistant tuberculosis and then they will think of maybe asthma or something like that then they will think of the cystic fibrosis which is the very first diagnosis that usually in the high income countries they usually think of but then the problem is they will think of high uh, the cystic fibrosis but they do not have the test for that they do not have the opportunities to get those children tested they will think of primary ciliary dyskinesia but again they do not have test is very readily available everywhere they will think of immunodeficiency and again they lack Uh, resources to do the tests, and when the resources are there, the people 
they are not insured, they have to take the, all this money from their pocket and they are not able to be diagnosed. So that is again something, a difference from the lower middle income countries to the high middle income countries. So what I want to stress with this World Bronchiectasis Day is that we have to be aware of, we have to make the people aware of this thing and not only we have to make them aware of this thing, but we also have to strive, we have to make efforts so that the difference between the two worlds of bronchitis, lower middle income countries and the high income countries, the difference in these two for the diagnosis, for the management that decreases over the time. We cannot do it in a day. It's not, uh, I mean, it's not a task uh, which can be done in a day, but obviously we can work on it and we can move forward. It's always like that. And with this bronchitis day, my message would be the same, that we have to continue. We may not be able to cultivate a garden. This is important. We may not be able to cultivate a garden, but at least we can pick up the thorns from the way so the people can walk on this way better or more easily than before. Coming to the, again, bronchiectasis. We talked about the etiology that is different. We talked about the clinical features which are the same. We talked about the diagnosis which needs the same test in the east or in the west. We need the same test, but they are available readily in the west. They are less readily available in the east. And the final part is actually that is of the treatment and the management. Again, this is a part where lower middle income countries and in the high middle income countries, there is a big gap. And that's really devastating. I mean, the child is diagnosed. You can help him. This is a one time he will be diagnosed. But what next? And that is the question. If it is, say, like uh, infection, that can be treated. But if it is uh, cystic fibrosis, if it is immune deficiency, if it is ciliary dyskinesia, then he needs a multidisciplinary approach. He needs multiple people to be involved. And this multiple people, a full team of physicians and the people involved in management is not available anywhere in the lower middle income countries and people are striving for that. But this is readily available in the high income countries. So once diagnosed, like Donla was saying, she, w she is having better and better uh, uh, machines, better and better equipment to manage her. Just by looking at her, when even I saw her first time in the Spain, I couldn't believe. Once she told me that I'm a patient of primary immunodeficiency, it was difficult for me to believe. She, she's so nice, always smiling and uh, moving around, so uh, doing a... Um, she was not left behind anywhere. She was rather walking very energetically everywhere. So it was difficult for me to believe that she is a patient of primary, uh, primary immune deficiency. <coughs> Had she been somewhere in the, um, uh, like in lower middle income countries, I even wonder she would have been, even she would have been li alive. Uh, what to talk of being so energetic and so healthy. Even on your camera, if you see, she doesn't look like uh, to be a patient uh, anyway. Although she, she is, uh, I mean, she's taking care of herself daily and the management is, although it's, and she has already enumerated that you need a good diet, you need a good care of your respiratory system, you have to take care of uh, your mental health, you, take, you have to take care of your physical health. This all thing is required, but also, uh, and I believe she, would, she is having less of, the, less of the exacerbations, which are very frequent in the lower middle income countries. Um, and that is why she is so healthy. And uh, you have to take care of that the people around you are not, uh, they are not sick. So she has already stressed these points and these are really necessary. But this is again a difference between the two worlds and we have to take care of this. So let's join hand with this World Bronchiectasis Day that we are going to minimize this gap and we are going to take care of all our patients and we are, making, we are going to make them aware and also make them aware to take care of themselves. So happy World Bronchitis Day. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Gupta, and Lauren for sharing your perspectives on this World Bronchiectasis Day. Uh, as the president of GAP, I would be remiss in not recognizing one of our GAP premier member organizations who has done so much work in this space. I'd like to recognize the COPD Foundation and its former CEO and the GAP Chief Re Research Scientific Officer, Ruth Talsinger, for their work in really bringing bronchiect bronchiectasis to the forefront of awareness and understanding on this World Bronchiectasis Day. Um, I'd like to get to some of your questions and thoughts here at the end of the time that we have left in our webinar before wrapping up and thanking our sponsors and our host organizations. So my first question is actually for you, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, you did such a wonderful job of painting the picture of the word pictures of the lungs and of the differences between low to middle income countries and high high income countries. And when I heard you, there were several things that stuck out. Number one, access to diagnostics and getting that early diagnosis is so accurate diagnosis is so very important. But also access to specialty care and access to treatment. And so speak a bit about how, again, what your experience has been in low to middle income countries versus high income countries on that access to specialty care, which is such a vital part of getting that diagnosis. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, uh, for bringing uh, up this issue, which is very uh, uh, critical. Uh, in the in the uh, for the world bronchiectasis day and the, for the people to know that how they can be diagnosed as i early said that the time duration between the diag between the symptoms and the diagnosis is, is very uh, prolonged actually in the lower middle income countries and why it is so the cause is the that the people they are not diagnosed because mainly people the first of all they go to the general physician so that is the first problem uh, and it's not actually a problem, but it, it is what they can, where they can go. 80% of our population, first of all, they will go to the uh, general physician. And to a pediatrician or then afterwards to the pediatric pulmonologist, coming to that, is a ratio increases. Only 10% of the people, they will go to the uh, pediatrician uh, at any time. So 80% they will remain with the general physician. So what the general physician, the Typical teaching by the WHO is that any fever and cough, both symptoms joint, if it is, and if it goes beyond three weeks, this has to be thought of as it is if it, as if it is tuberculosis. So they will give a treatment of tuberculosis. So once it finishes after six months, or previously it was nine months, so then again, child will be somewhat better because infection has been treated, so he will be better. So once he is better, he will again come, and they will think, they will give another course of antibiotic. Third time they will think this is resistant antibiotic, so they will go with that. Then if it is not settled, then they will okay ask, uh, maybe go to the pediatrician, maybe to somebody else, or maybe they can themselves advise the, the CT, uh, CT scan chest, but this CT scan chest is again not readily available everywhere. There is a problem. And the people uh, cannot go there. It is costly. The second thing, they are, it's not insured. People are not insured. So they have to uh, spend all this money out of their pocket. They have to travel along. Uh, they have to travel long distances before they can reach somewhere where the, the CT chest is available. And the other tests, they are, again, they are more expensive for the immunodeficiency, for the cystic fibrosis, for ciliary dyskinesia. All these tests, they are more costly, and they are available only at specialized center. They are not readily available everywhere. So my experience with this is that we have got uh, quite underreported. As you said, it's more than 300 cases, uh, more than half a million cases uh, in America. So our figure is we take it into actually per 100,000. And per 100,000, the variation is the people in, say, in Australia or in America, they are around more than 500 or 700 cases per 100,000. But in uh, lower mid middle income countries, the ratio is, uh, is uh, less than even five or 10 per 100,000. So this is a difference in the uh, reported bronchiectasis cases. But actually in the lower middle income countries, this is being underreported. Because children are there, 
like cystic fibrosis, there are many people, but they are undiagnosed. And that is again one of the cause of bronchiectasis. Tuberculosis is one of the, infection is very common, that is also common. So my experience has been with this uh, bronchiectasis, especially in children, is a delayed one, and that is because of the non-availability of the um, resources to be diagnosed, and they takes a longer time. So thank you, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, very helpful in helping to understand the difference between access to specialty care, access to diagnosis, and access to effective treatments um, in low to middle income countries versus high income countries. My next question is actually going to Dr. Gupta, who did, uh, again, such a wonderful um, presentation on the basic clinical representation of bronchiectasis. And one of the things that I heard here you, that you touched on, Dr. Gupta, was around the genetic and environmental components, but also the need for greater research and understanding of epidemiology, but also the um, understanding of the hope of eradication. And so I'd like for you to comment maybe on, if you look forward five to 10 years, what do, is your hope that we will move forward in this space of bronchiectasis? Thank you, Tonya, for the uh, interesting question that you raised. Uh, the point is very clear <coughs> because uh, as uh, Dr. Mustafa has also said, uh, bronchiectasis from the low middle income countries is underreported. One, because uh, the medical fraternity is also not oriented towards uh, diagnosing bronchiectasis. One, number two, uh, <coughs> the lack of resources. And the third important thing is uh, if you have a diagnosis, it's reasonably late in the course of the disease. So the focus has to be uh, to pick up, uh, one, to pick up the disease early. Number two, to work on preventing these diseases from happening. And as I had identified earlier, yes, uh, a lot of these uh, are secondary to infections. And because infections being more rampant in that part of the world, it's going to be much. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a much uh, lower intervention uh, that's required. It's only creating awareness and knowledge amongst uh, the medical personnel and the community at large. So it's going to be more of public education, uh, which is going to take care of bronchiectasis. And if uh, GAP and other organizations stay active in this field, I believe uh, in the down the line, uh, when you say five to ten years. In the lower middle income countries, it's going to be a much larger impact because they are preventable, more easily preventable as compared to the higher income or the Western world. Because the Western world, the issues are more of uh, immune deficiencies, genetic disorders, which uh, will again take a lot of time to really respond. Even in from the Western world, there have been major developments in the uh, field of gene therapy. Monogenic mutations are being better treated with gene therapy. So. Down the line in 10 years, I think it's going to be a different world, but it all would require perseverance from the organizations, especially what I always say, it's going to be organizations like GAP sensitizing their policymakers, the medical fraternity and the community at large. Thank you, and I agree. We have to call upon governments and World Health Organization, but we also have to continue to raise that patient voice. And we started today's webinar with that patient perspective from Ms. Lauren Dunlap. I'd like to wrap up with the final question and considerations, comments from Ms. Dunlap. So Lauren, again, you've been on this journey for quite a long time, and we heard that one of the key aspects of living with bronchiectasis, non-CF bronchiectasis, is the concerns around quality of life. So if you're speaking to the hundreds of thousands of individuals that are out there living with this condition, whether they be from a low to middle income country or from a high income country, what are those final words of hope that you would give to them? Don't let your diagnosis control your life and do what you wanna do, no matter what. Um, and also find a treatment that works for you and is affordable. Um, one of the things that I kept thinking about when you were talking about the lower, middle, and high-income countries was I think there is a misconception around high-income countries that health care treatment is affordable. It's not. <laughs> so one thing um, I, I showed you earlier, for example, I showed you earlier a picture of that, uh, the vest, monic and, and the airway clearance system. That machine is about $30,000. So 
talk about affordable. <laughs> so I think there is a misconception there around treatment for, for this because it is chronic and debilitating. But going back to um, your question, Tanya, was it's just, I say this all the time over and over again, don't let your diagnosis control who you are or what you want to do. You have to limit certain things, but you can still live your best life as well. Um, and it is exciting time that there has been so much research um, in this particular field where there hasn't been before. Even in the last five years, I was diagnosed, you know, what, 14 years ago, and there was, there was nothing available for around resources, tools, or even any research going on there. So it's, it's very exciting, and also maybe patients getting more involved with either clinical trials or treatments, things that they can actively participate in and have a voice in, too. I think those are also important. Thank you, Lauren, and I, I couldn't agree more. On this World Bronchiectasis Day 2023, there is hope. There's hope of individual, at an individual level of getting the appropriate diagnosis, treatment, and care that's needed, regardless of where you live across the world. There's hope of connecting with communities like the Bronchiectasis NTM 360 program at COPD Foundation. There's hope for connecting on a global level with organizations like GAP and ADA and supporting the efforts to continue to raise that patient voice. On behalf of our organizations, GAP and ADA, on behalf of Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Gupta, and Lauren today, I just want to thank you for your participation. We hope that you found it to be informational and inspirational. And again, we wish you a very productive World Bronchiectasis Day. Happy, Happy World Bronchiectasis Day. Day.